Councilman, it's time to to get going. So today we deal with theory of international trade. International trade. There is no chapter from the book assigned for this particular topic, and uh, the reading for this topic here is in your welcome module, uh, the book which is posted online is a short book called Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. Economics in One Lesson and a small chapter from that book which is titled Who is Protected by Tariffs? Who is Protected? by tariffs. That's the reading for today. So no Alchian and Allen chapters today, just this brief, I have four or five pages chapter from Henry Haslin's book. You have it you have it in your files and you have it also in the welcome module listed. So just read that and you will be okay. So Theory of international trade is one of the topics um, I usually say that it's not my original phrase or syntax, but I like to repeat it because I think it's true that usually whatever problem of public policy or economic policy you talk about, two economists, three opinions about it. So there's a very large amount of disagreement about economics. Whatever topic you choose, spending, uh, taxes, uh, environmental policy, healthcare, what kind of healthcare system should adopt, and so on. This is not one of these areas. The opinions that economists hold about free trade and protectionism are pretty much uniform. In 95 to 99 percent of all economists agree that free trade is good and protectionism is bad. So unlike the general public, there seems to be this large disconnect between the professional opinion of economists about trade and what the general public believes, including many very intelligent and educated people who are not economists. So it's not a sign of, of like a lack of sophistication or, or intelligence, but it's a sign of an insufficient economic education, let's say, this anti-free trade and protectionist sentiments that exist out there. I'll try to demonstrate to you today some of the theoretical reasons for this apparent consensus among the economists about the benefits of free trade and to try and explain a very simple model of international trade that shows the benefits of free exchange and the problems and downsides of protectionism. So in order to do so, I would need your help, actually. There are some concepts you remember. I told you for the final exam, it will be mostly the material for from after the meter. There are some exceptions, and today you'll see some of these exceptions. Some of the stuff that you were supposed to have learned before the midterm, and that I expect you to know any time of the day. Three or four concepts that you need to understand what I'm going to be talking about today. Without that, you're completely lost. So these are the concepts. Comparative advantage, number one. This is the core. This concept is the core of the trade theory. The entire international trade theory is just an, one simple and straightforward application of the principle of comparative advantage. Okay. Second concept is consumer surplus. And the third concept is producer surplus. So I have to assume that you're familiar with these concepts by now. I don't have time to go over all of them sufficient detail to reintroduce you to them. I have to assume that you are familiar with them. 
as we go along, I may say something about them, some kind of clarification or some kind of additional thoughts about them, but I don't have time now to once again go over all three of them. I will just assume that you're familiar with them. Am I right? Do you remember these three concepts you can define? Okay. As we go along, if you if you don't understand something or you have some questions, I, I may divert some time to clarifying them. But for now, I'm going to dogmatically assume that you know them. So the primary reason why um, economists it's, it's an imprecise expression, but I don't have any better. Believe in free trade or believe that the free trade is an optimal policy is that the free trade pretty much directly follows from the principle of comparative advantage. OK, so can anyone now define for us? Let's check for a moment. What is comparative advantage? How do you define? You're talking about two persons, two economic agents. One of them has a comparative advantage in doing certain job or certain task. Maybe they have like more experience or better tools. Okay. They might. Yeah, do a right? so, substitutes. Uh, it has to do with substitutes in which sense? Uh, like if one person has a competitive advantage over one product, the other one can have a, um, a comparable product, uh, a substitute for that. Huh? Okay, so they might be producing comparable products. Co somewhat close, but not quite. Remember the example? I will just give you two names, Jeff Bezos and Janitor. Anyone remembers this example that I always like to, use, like to use? So Jeff Bezos is thinking about hiring a janitor for his company. And Jeff Bezos realizes that all available applicants are worse than himself, that he himself can do the job two times more productively than the next than the best available janitor on the market. The question is, should Jeff Bezos hire and janitors. Why? Yeah. So, so the answer is yes or no? no. Should he hire? Oh, yeah, he should. Yes, the answer is yes. Why? Jeff Bezos has an, we call that absolute advantage over any given janitor, which means that he can provide tasks more cheaply, quicker, with less, with low, with, with less labor hours than any janitor. Why would he hire? A janitor, the answer is that his time is better spent elsewhere. So what does that mean? That means that the janitor can provide the janitor services to the Amazon corporation at a lower opportunity cost than Jeff Bezos. Lower opportunity cost. See, I cannot bludgeon you over the head with opportunity cost the entire semester. Avoid it. What does that mean? That means that the value that society loses by a janitor doing janitor's job is far lower than the value that society loses by Jeff Bezos working at the janitor's job. Which means that the next best alternative available to any janitor applicant is far lower paid and far lower, far less productive than the next best alternative to Jeff Bezos. What is the next best alternative for Jeff, Be Jeff Bezos to work as a CEO of an Amazon corporation and create millions of dollars per hour? Probably. I don't know. What is his net worth? 200 billion, whatever. How much money he produces every minute his work. So the value that society would lose by Jeff, Be by Jeff Bezos working even four hours per day as a janitor is infinitely higher than the value that society loses by a janitor working as a janitor. Four or eight hours. 
because the next best alternative for him is probably something even less paid than the janitor's job. Otherwise, he wouldn't have applied for the job. So you see now the disconnect between absolute advantage. The absolute advantage is that Jeff Bezos is better in doing the job. He's more productive, but the comparative advantage is the ability to provide a service or a good at a lower opportunity cost, which means by sacrificing less value for society by doing, by doing so. So paradoxically, although Jeff Bezos has an absolute advantage over the, over the janitor, over any of the janitor applicants, the janitor has, an, has a comparative advantage over Jeff Bezos. So comparative advantage, is the ability to provide a good or service at a lower opportunity cost than somebody else. The comparative advantage is now the second point, is the principle for specialization or division of labor. And we decide whether somebody, what is it that you should specialize in producing? That's a question that society has to answer. Because we know that specialization is productive division of labor is productive. If everybody tries to produce everything, we will end up in a very poor society. The modern market economy is based on specialization and division of labor. Now, the next question arises, who should specialize in what? And the answer to that question is provided by the principle of comparative advantage. That says people should provide, specialize 100% in those activities that they have a comparative advantage. OK, which means then that in our simple case of Jeff Bezos and uh, janitor, janitor should work 100% of his labor time as a janitor, and Jeff Bezos should work 100% of the time as a CEO of the corporation. Any other pattern of specialization would have been less productive. Imagine, for example, that they separated 50-50. Uh, that Bezos is working 50% as a CEO, 50% as a janitor, and janitor 50% as a janitor, 50% as a CEO. What would be the aggregate, the total amount of value that two of them could create that way? Far lower than if they work 100% one, 100% the other. Bezos would be creating, you see, 50% less value as a CEO, and a slightly more value as a, as a janitor. Whereas the janitor would screw up, probably the company would go belly up if, if you give Amazon Corporation to me. Right? Or with all due respect, probably most of you, maybe some of entrepreneurial geniuses out there, but probably not as good, nearly as good as Jack Bezos. So the total amount of value created that way, that way would have been far lower. If, they, if, if they're inconsistent in specialization. So you need to specialize 100% for what you are best at, and what you are best at is answered by the principle of comparative advantage. Then comparative advantage, another aspect of it, is that it allows people with different levels of productivity to cooperate, to associate, which means it allows Jeff Bezos and janitor to associate together and to benefit from mutual cooperation. Irrespective of the fact that Jeff Bezos is better both as a CEO of Amazon.com as well as a janitor, it makes sense for him, it's beneficial to him to hire a janitor because, both, because he frees up his time to create additional value as a CEO. And it benefits the janitor to associate with Jeff Bezos because he gets a job that is better than any other available alternative. It's a win-win situation, both sides. So that's a fundamental principle that different levels of productivity and different levels of skills are not the obstacle for mutual cooperation. Economics is not a zero-sum game. If I'm, be if I'm better in everything, than you, still it will make sense for us to cooperate because I will be better to the different degrees than you uh, in different activities. Bezos is, is 100, 1,000 times better as a CEO, but maybe two times better as a janitor. 
So then he has a comparative advantage in this thing there, where, where he is 1,000 times better. So it makes sense for him to outsource this other activity to Jeff. Now, as you remember, just replace Jeff Bezos with America and Janitor in China, and you get your basic case for free international free trade. So imagine that Americans, very simple model here, USA, here China. A very simple model in which you have just two goods produced by um, Americans and two goods produced by Chinese, and ignore everything else. Let's say IT products and vaccines, coronavirus vaccines. All of them require a very high level of research and development, sophistication and, and knowledge. And here you have plastic toys and cheap clothes. And let's say that Americans are three times better in making these, American labor force, American economy, and 100 times better in making these. Does it make any sense to put that then the principle says, the principle of comparative advantage, that Americans should work 100% of their time and 100% of American resources should be devoted to making the IT products and vaccines. Although we are three times better and more productive, it doesn't make sense. Nothing more than, than it, would, it would make sense for Jeff Bezos to work even one hour as a janitor. And let the Chinese produce 100% of supply of plastic toys and cheap clothes. What we do eventually, we exchange our surpluses. So the total amount of IT products, vaccines, plastic toys and cheap clothes for both Americans and Chinese will be maximized as compared to any other alternative situation. So it has to protest, oh, we are not making plastic toys. Chinese are eating our lunch. Chinese are beating us because they make more cheap clothes. We used to make them more before. Now we don't make it. No, it doesn't make any sense. Yes, they are making cheap clothes, but they should be made. It's our economic interest that they make cheap clothes and selling it to us. Vaccines, because what if we just like, no, we don't want to sell any vaccines? Oh, yeah, uh, we are assuming here free trade. We are assuming here that the governments are not jealous and they don't want strategically to. Yeah, we are just using the economic logic. You very well might be right when it comes to real world situations that this model wouldn't hold. But, but there are many other, other things that are not realistically captured in this model. We just assume that there is a free trade. We assume that there is a free trade here. So then I remember one example of President Trump, who is a very, very strident proponent of protection, is saying uh, in, a, in a video interview, in a television interview a few years ago, oh, when I was building a, a Trump Tower in New York, we would be buying glass from uh, American companies from Idaho and North Carolina and nowadays we are not making it at all. I, I'm buying whenever I build something I buy from Chinese. That's bad. That has to stop. We are not making anything. Chinese are taking over it. That's a classical mistake of ignoring comparative advantage. Of course, we were making much more glass 50 years ago, but now we are making other stuff. We have a bigger fish to fry now. Chinese can provide those goods, those resources at cheaper price at a lower opportunity cost. So that's not a problem. That's not that's not a feature. That's a bug. That's a that, that's a that's a part and parcel of a more efficient and more integrated international economic system, in which we procure goods and services from whomever can sell it at a cheaper price in in, in the international market. So in in order for us, in order for us. To produce more cheap clothes and plastic toys or glass for President Trump's high-rise buildings or, or other things, we will have to reduce our production of IT products, vaccines, and other things. That, that, that there is not un, an unlimited quantity of resources that we have. We have to decide where our labor force and our machines and tools and equipment and, and financial capital will be invested. 
you want more cheap clothes and more plastic toys, and you want more glass produced by Americans, you will have to go with less research and development, less IT, less vaccines, and other stuff. We cannot produce everything. Nobody can produce it. So what is then free trade? Free trade is just a system when you allow comparative advantage and division of labor to grow beyond to grow beyond national borders. You don't put artificial breaks, artificial barriers to this process at national borders. Simple. Just Jeff Bezos's and janitors of this world from different countries being allowed to do the same thing. As simple as that. What are tariffs then? Yeah, taxes on imports. So tariffs are various. Tariffs are uh, instruments of government policy that try to kind of limit the benefits of this international division of labor. Taxes on import. So you tax the plastic toys. So what is your, your goal? Your goal is to allow American producers of plastic toys to be competitive with Chinese. By saying to, to Chinese exporters to America, you have to pay 20% more. You have to charge 20% more for your products than otherwise. That makes American producers then able to charge 20% higher prices. So the classic justification, what is the classic justification for for tariff policy is to protect domestic jobs. Domestic or improve domestic jobs and employment. We need our plastic toys and cheap clothes producers to increase the employment or to protect their jobs here in the Chinese competition. And we're gonna do it by enacting tariffs. There are other instruments of protectionist policies, but their, their, their final goal is the same, to limit the supply of foreign goods in our country. Quotas, for example. So what are quotas? These are quantitative limitations. You can sell 500,000 pieces of product in America, and for, for any additional quantity, you will have to pay higher tariff, or you're prohibited from selling. So we have one example in 1980s. There was a panic. At that time, there was a panic that the Japanese are taking over. We are not producing anything. We are importing everything from Japan. So the Japanese were the Chinese of 1980s. And President, Re President Reagan was a free trade, uh, free, free market and free trade president. But nevertheless, he succumbed to the protectionist pressures. And he convinced the Japanese, Japanese cars particularly, they are destroying Detroit and American automobile industry. They're selling this cheap. They are cheap products, Toyotas and Mazdas and so on. And President Reagan convinced the Japanese to uh, to impose, to self-impose uh, voluntary quotas. So we are going to sell whatever, 3 million cars in America and, and all of that. So this was not protectionism in the technical sense. He didn't impose any tariffs, but he just convinced them to to limit the exportation of their cars to America. So that's also another tool, tool of, of protectionist policy. But the economic results are always the same. Economic results are always the same. So finally, we eventually we'll see that the domestic industries are not protected by protectionist policies, by tariffs. That Eventually, there are two kinds of effects that I will demonstrate to you in a moment. Two effects of tariffs on economic welfare. The first order effect is, is a transfer of wealth from consumers to producers. Let's say the distribution from consumers to producers. 
but this makes sense intuitively. Tariffs increase prices, both domestic and foreign products, and higher prices are charged to consumers, so producers earn more money and consumers have to pay more. But it's a transfer of wealth from producers to consumers. But there is a second order effect here, that in the process, the total amount of wealth in society decreases. Not only that the wealth is redistributed from consumers to producers, but the total wealth decreases. This is called dead weight loss. Dead weight loss. So in the process of protection is the redistribution of wealth from consumers to producers, something is lost for everybody, the total economic pie is shrinking. I'll show you graphically now, I initially intended to show you a graph on, on this equipment, but it, it didn't work. Imagine for a moment, you have a situation like this. Here is the quantity, here is the price. Let's say it's steel market. Steel market in the United States. What determines the price of, uh, of steel in any given, price of any commodity in any given market? Supply and demand. Let's say that this is supply curve in the United States. Supply curve of domestic countries. So higher the price of steel, more steel they will be producing. Imagine for now that America is an isolated country that doesn't trade with anybody. So you will have a demand for steel. This is the demand curve. And you have a supply. The price would be determined by the intersection of domestic, this is domestic supply curve and domestic demand curve. Okay, so then the price, the equilibrium price will be here and here is the quantity of steel that will be sold on the market. Now, imagine now that we have a free trade with the entire world. And the American production of steel is relatively small as compared to the total production of steel in the world. And let's say that the world price of steel is far lower. This initial price of steel is over here. Whatever it is. $20 per so unit of weight. So American firms cannot influence this price. They have to take it as like a price taker because the size of American steel industry as compared to the size of the entire world steel industry is relatively small. So you cannot change your price if there is a free trade. We assume now that there is free trade, that American consumers, users of steel are free to buy steel from whomever they want. So now the question is, if this were the case, what will be the quantity of steel that is, that is both in America, and how much of that steel would be domestically produced, and how much of that steel would be imported abroad? Uh, okay. <coughs> You'd probably import more. How much more? Can you can we show that on the graph here? So this is the price. Total total uh, sales. From domestic, it would be that last one. The left one, yes. that's, that's for, for domestic supply. Domestically produced, yeah, excellent. And so this is quantity one. What is the quantity, the total quantity? The difference between the next, those two. So what is the total quantity that will be bought on the domestic market? This is the total quantity that will be produced and sold by domestic steel. But what is the total quantity of steel bought by domestic users, by the people who need steel? It's the demand curve, an intersection of the price line here. Let's say this is quantity four. 
this is the demand curve, this is price. This is the total amount of steel that will be bought in that case. So then what is the quantity of importation? That's this difference here. So this is domestically produced. This is total quantity of steel. Quantity four minus one is importation. That's the quantity of steel that Americans would buy from foreign suppliers. Now, consumer and producer surplus. What what are these? Difference, Difference between what? Exactly. So the consumer surplus is a difference between the maximum price that the buyer is ready to pay and the real price that he pays. So then what is the consumer surplus that American buyers of steel derive from buying the steel at price P1? So they're on the demand curve here. So only those buyers who value steel per unit of weight at more than $20, we'll be buying it. So only those buyers up here who are ready to buy any quantity of steel at a higher price of $20, they will be deriving consumer surplus from buying it for 20 bucks. So this entire triangle here will be consumer surplus. That's how much value all of the buyers who buy steel at $20 would be deriving from buying steel at the world market price in a free trade period. Okay. Now imagine for a moment that we increase so notice something how lower the price under free trade is that then it would have been under complete ban on foreign importation. This is the price that would have prevailed if American government prohibited any importation whatsoever of steel. Now imagine that, uh, let's say, 33% tax, 33% 33 uh, uh, tariff was imposed. So then the price, domestic, price the domestic buyers of steel have to pay would have increased from $20 to $30. Uh, one more thing. Consumer surplus is the difference between the maximum buying price and the market price. What is producer surplus? Can you tell me that? It's the other way around. It's the difference between, so buyer has a maximum buying price, what the seller has? Selling. Minimum selling price. So the price below which you wouldn't sell. So only those sellers who can afford, typically because they have a lower cost, to sell at a price lower than the market price, they will be selling. You sell only if what you get is more valuable than what you offer in exchange. So if your minimum selling price is $15 and the market price is $20, your producer surplus is $5. So only this part of domestic supply curve will be participating in the market. And only this small triangle here will be producer surplus under free trade. Producer surplus under free trade. Only this small triangle, see, below the price line, limited by the vertical axis, the domestic supply curve and the price line. So you see very large consumer surplus, this gigantic triangle, and a very small producer surplus. Now the price increases because of a 33% tariff. So everybody has to charge $3. Everybody gets gets to charge $3. Foreigners, because they, they, they pay $10 tariff. Domestic firms, because they can afford now, they don't have to match lower 20%. Now the price, the foreign price that they have to match is artificially increased to $30. So now, can you tell me what is the domestically produced quantity of steel under 
under 33% tariff. Someone else? It used to be here. Where is it now? Here. Yeah. So. This is quantity two. This is new domestic. So you see it increased as expected. Domestic firms in the short run will increase production. What is the total quantity of steel that will be bought? What happened to it? Demand curve, so it went down. So this quantity three is a new total demand, total quantity demanded under the tariff regime. So you see what happens with the tariff, uh, total quantity demanded goes down because higher price is basic for slow demand. Higher price, lower quantity demand. That's expected. The first law of supply, higher the price, higher the quantity demanded for domestic firms. All pretty much expected. What happened to the importation? The imported quantity of steel. It used to be 4 minus 1. What is it now? 3 minus 2. So it shrank to only this. Quantity 3 minus quantity 2. That's the value of imports. Now, let's see what happened now. We want to demonstrate first this redistributive effect of tariffs. Value that's been shifted from consumers to producers. So consumer surplus is a measure of consumer benefit from trade. Producer surplus is a measure of producer benefit from trade. Okay? If producer surplus increases as a consequence of a given change, we say then that the producers benefit. If consumer surplus increases, we say that consumers value increased as a consequence of that change. So what happened happened as a consequence of this particular change here? What is now the producer surplus for domestic steel producers? It's this small triangle plus this trapezoid here. So you see how producer surplus for domestic sellers increased significantly. So far, so good. So we see producers benefit as expected. What happens to consumer surplus? What is now, which surface now represents the consumer surplus? This is the new price. This triangle here. Yeah, this entire portion here. Dots, dotted portion is eliminated. Is not a part of consumer surplus anymore. It used to be this triangle. Now it's just this triangle. Okay. This entire whatever is this trapezoid is now gone. So consumers lost, consumer surplus dramatically down, producer surplus significantly up. So the first order effect demonstrated. Yeah. The redistribution of resources. But now look what happened in addition to that. This is producer surplus. What happened to this part of the of the ex consumer surplus under the free trade? Let's say this rectangle here. What is that? What is that? Quantity three minus quantity two is the amount of importation. What is this re rectangle then? No, no, that's one one side of the rectangle. What's the other side? <coughs> Sorry. Price. Price increase. A tariff. So tariff rate times the quantity of imported goods equals what? Tariff revenue for the government. So that's the value. So you see what happened. Government and producers ganging up 
on consumers and stealing part of their economic benefits. Tariff revenue is this producer surplus that used to be consumers, part of consumer surplus. So the government and producers benefiting consumers suffering. But have you noticed something strange? That's not the end. That's not the whole image. Those two triangles here and here, what happened to, to that part of consumer surplus? Who captured that? Just gone. That's your dead way loss. That's the loss of wealth for the society as a whole. So these two triangles just disappeared. So that means not only that you have a redistributive effect in terms of governments and producers taking part of consumer benefits for themselves, you have in the process part of previous consumer benefits disappearing completely. So the sum total of government and producer benefits with tariffs is less than the sum total of consumer benefits in a free trade. Really. It's called misallocative effect, which means that for a variety of reasons, the total amount of wealth was destroyed. In the process. So why is that the case? What do you think? You think theoretically, why would this happen? Yeah. Less production of what? Less production, lower total demand that will be simply satisfied by a different combination of domestic and foreign supply. But at least you can say that domestic steel, domestic jobs, and domestic fortunes of, dom of steel industry are protected in the short term. So that, that, that's a trade-off. The government gets some tax revenue that they didn't have. Domestic steel producers have some revenue that they wouldn't have had otherwise. And consumers suffer and the entire economy suffers as a less, as a steel available, lower quantity of steel at higher prices. What are then the further effects? And we go further and speculate. What's going to happen next? Less cars and buildings. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So less cars and buildings, or cars and buildings that would be more expensive. Okay. Why is that bad? What are some of the effects of that? So people will be buying less cars for buildings. Less jobs in car producing and, and building, constructing companies. Or maybe if demand for cars and buildings is highly inelastic, which means that it doesn't react, doesn't change as a function of price much. What's going to happen then? If demand is inelastic. So people will be buying the equal quantity of cars and buildings as before, irrespective of the fact that the car, that the price of steel is a, as a key component of these products. As a, exactly. Bro, how? What is that called? That's called income effect. So that means less money for other goods. So somebody else is going to suffer. There will be less clothes or less vacations, uh, uh, revenue for tourist company, cruisers will have less cruiser company or airline companies or whoever, computer selling firms. So other goods will suffer. So it's called the income effect because then <coughs> the purchasing power of the rest of the income goes down because you have to 
the purchasing power of the of the whole of your income goes down because you have to pay more for one or a set of items that you're paying or less money remains for, for everything else so see then the tariffs do not protect the jobs they protect some jobs but destroy other jobs so what about the steel industry in the long run now the the worst thing is actually that in the long run even the steel industry jobs will be undermined So we assume the, the best case scenario for the steel industry that the prices are highly inelastic. The second law of demand, whatever elasticity coefficient is, there is always some pressure for substitution, smaller or higher. Even is, if, if the demand curve is highly inelastic, what happens with the passage of time? Remember this fan of demand curves. This is the short term, medium term, long term demand curve. More time passes, the demand curve gets more horizontal, which means more elastic, which means people have more time to figure out the substitutes, both consumers and producers. So then the longer a tariff remains in place for any product, more elastic the demand curve for that product to get, which means more sensitive to changes in prices, more likely to find substitutes people will be. More elastic the demand curve gets, less capable of maintaining its position is firm will be. If demand shifts from steel to something else, maybe steel is not the, 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 the best example because it's intuitively not really easy to figure out what the substitute would be, but even for steel in, in, in various utilizations, there are substitutes. Profit and revenues of steel industry would go down with more elastic demand curves than the employment in steel industry would go down as well. So with the passage of time, more, lo more longer the period of time that the tariff remains in place, the competitive position of, of a protected firm uh, deteriorates. Because its, it's demand curve tends to get more and more horizontal, more and more elastic as time goes by. As the second law of demand, another so first and second law of demand, consumer producer surplus comparative advantage. These things you need to know. So what else? So going back to Jeff Bezos and um, janitor, he said it would have been a misallocation of resources if they tried to work 50% of both jobs. That would be a wrong utilization of their of their abilities. Oh, the same applies to steel. What you do when you impose a tariff, you're not only redistributing money, you're not only reducing domestic supply, you are actually misallocating resources. You are moving or shifting labor force and machinery and equipment and financial capital into less productive business ventures. You're wasting societal resources that could have been used elsewhere better. You're propping up an industry which is relatively less efficient and reducing the level of societal wealth that way because the same resources would have been used to produce greater value elsewhere. So see, the tariffs, not only do they rip off the consumer for the benefit of producer in the government, they in a multiple in multiple ways uh, undermine the uh, economic productivity of the entire economy by changing the structure of industry in a way of propping up relatively less productive industries and undermining or reducing the supply of resources for more productive industries. OK, any final questions? So chapter what is the chapter? 
who is protected by tariffs from Henry Hazlitt books. If you have trouble finding it uh, on Canvas, email me. I'll I'll send it to you. Okay. Have a nice weekend, all, and I'll see you see you next week. Thank mm -hmm. you.